Hi, thanks so much for coming. My name is Steve Gravestock. I'm a senior programmer at the Toronto International Film Festival, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to TIFF, uh, TIFF's Bell Lightbox, and to this screening of Young Chang's Up the Yangtze, which is part of our uh, uh, program See the North, of, uh, a year-round screening of uh, for, uh, Canadian classic films for free. It used to be called uh, Canadian Open Vault, but See the North is a little jazzier and... Uh, uh, you're here for the first one. Uh, to begin, we'd like to acknowledge uh, that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas and New Credit, and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I'd also like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa, and TIFF Cinematech's public supporters, Ontario Creates, and the Canada Council for the Arts. And also a big, big thanks to Zuma Radio and the new Classical FM for supporting the program, and also the National Film Board of Canada for uh, uh, sending us this new DCP of the film. Um, as a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming educational and community outreach initiatives possible. It's a real pleasure to be up here to introduce uh, this film and this filmmaker. Uh, Young Chang is, award -winning, uh, is an award-winning director of Up the Yangtze, obviously, China Heavyweight, and The Fruit Hunters. He's a member of the Directors Guild of Canada and the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. He's currently completing a screenplay for his first dramatic feature, Eggplant, and is in production on a feature documentary about Robert Fisk. His most recent film is Gatekeeper. Um, and we've had a long relationship with Young Chang uh, over the years. Uh, he is, um, uh, I think one of the great things about him is that he's driven by curiosity and courage, which are essential things for a, a filmmaker, and particularly a documentary filmmaker. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Young Chang. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve, and, and, uh, and thank you all um, for uh, coming out in this crazy weather um, uh, that's a testament to your uh, to you for, for willing to, to brave this this these temperatures and uh, um, and to see this old movie um, I actually haven't seen this film in as long as it's what have been about 12 years 11 12 years uh, so I'm gonna sit in the audience and and watch this with uh, for the first time in a long time. Um, sort of seeing it new uh, with fresh eyes. Um, you know, uh, I like to think of this movie now as sort of a time capsule in a way. And uh, um, it'd be interesting at the Q&A after to kind of reflect on that and see uh, how this, maybe the, the subject matter and how this film fits in today's world. And uh, so much of what was covered in that movie has already transpired and things have changed and China is a, a world power now and uh, and I'd like to think a little bit about that. Um, so thank you to Tiff, to Steve, all your support all these years and uh, and of course the National Film Board for putting together this uh, this screening. I apologize to my mother for my attire, who's in the audience, uh, but I'm grateful for her to bring out um, the town of Whitby and uh, to come see the film uh, and Toronto. I don't know if some of you are from there, um, but uh, but thank you all, and uh, we'll we'll talk later. Thank you. Stick around. We'll be back. <laughs> Comments, questions, cool. travel tips. Yeah, right there. Uh, there is a mic, actually. Uh, so, uh, for the gentleman there, if you could just... There is a mic, right? You can... Uh, you, I'll repeat it, just yeah. down. Sorry. We found him, it's all right. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, um, if, if you, at any point, felt, while you were making the movie, um, the kind of irony that I think a lot of viewers would feel, at least that I felt, uh, in that you're making a government-sponsored movie about the government sort of taking things away. Um, at the you, same you're time, you're talking about Canada, the government of Canada, yeah. the National Film Board, and not to not to excuse the government of Canada, like for making up for you know the Chinese government or anything. Uh, earlier today, I was reading about um, like government. Indigenous stewardship grants, right? Which feels equally ironic at our time where 
the government seems to be taking away the rights of indigenous people to steward their land, right? So, I, I, if I could, I mean, the interesting question and a hard one to start off the uh, Q and A <laughs> with. Uh, I would say, firstly, that the National Film Board of Canada is is not a uh, considered a you know a, a government um, you know f uh, sort of government uh, directed. Uh, institution. It's actually at a very arm's length. And uh, hell, I'm making a film about Robert Fisk right now. If anybody knows who he is, uh, he's quite uh, a controversial journalist. Um, so I would say that um, uh, there wasn't any, you know, I, I see what you mean in terms of the irony, but uh, in terms of what I had to do to make the film, uh, I was very much focused on uh, the story that I had to tell. Um, and I was very grateful to have money from from anyone actually to make the movie, and certainly so much so that uh, here in Canada we have that kind of support uh, from you know arm's length institutions like the National Film Board of Canada who can support stories that are told by someone like myself um, back in the day. And I can say it in this way because it, I think it's kind of old this movie. Uh, back in the day, you know, um, a lot of uh, you know very. Uh, topical and forward progressive conversations weren't happening exactly like they are today. So that's interesting that you bring it up because I do think it's a reflection of the times as well, your question. Um, uh, but I, I, uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think I would exist as a filmmaker without support from institutions like the National Film Board of Canada. And I think uh, I would continue to continue to tell stories that I feel that I, I'd like to tell and that um, people may want to watch, and they may not always, always be in line with, uh, you know, certainly what uh, where people's politics align with. Yeah. Do, do you want to talk a bit about seeing it again after? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's uh, yeah. Um, it's weird to see it. Uh, that was my first feature um, as a filmmaker. Um, <laughs> without being too self-critical, uh, it certainly I think. It's interesting. I, I think uh, um, I feel like it's still relevant. You know, I think it has a, a sense of um, certainly because it's a character-driven story. I feel like um, a lot of the youth of China and anywhere in the world today do do encounter these kind of, um, of course, different scales of uh, of class and and poverty and and such, but still encounter these sort of issues. Um, certainly with Yu Shui, the girl in the film, I don't think that uh, that would be unheard of to find someone like herself today. I do think that there's, um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what the audience thinks of that connection and its relevancy. You know, at the time, I think uh, this film was popular because a lot of the Western world didn't really know what was going on in mainland China. And, um, and my film, I think, sort of kind of slipped in at that moment. Uh, just before the Beijing Olympics in uh, in 2008, and so I think there was a lot of fervor about learning about the country of China, and, and at the time, uh, you know, China was on the rise. Everyone was talking about the rising, you know, dragon, um, but it hadn't really hit. And uh, and I think 10 years, 12 years says a lot. You know. Does anybody want to respond, or uh, uh, if we can get the mic down here, yeah. Uh, Right, the gentleman right here. I want to thank you for making the film. I think it was very relevant and insightful, or revealing to me, at, at least. And there's sort of like a, a lot of woven uh, cultural aspects to this, kind of the rural versus the urban, the progress versus kind of living off the land. I'm wondering sort of you were immersed in it for a period yeah. of time. I'd like to know how long that time was, mm -hmm. but also if there's any sort of personal lessons learned or, or some wisdom that you've gained yeah, from sure. doing the film. Yeah, good question. Um, well, I, I spent a year in Chongqing making the film, and uh, and certainly it was a lead up of a couple of years to raise the financing and research to, to secure the sort of story I wanted to tell at the time. Um, you know, I went in with a lot of, uh, Misconceptions, preconceptions. I I went in as a young filmmaker, um, who I'm I'm a Chinese, of, uh, but born here in Canada, and I went in with these kind of ideas. You know, um, 
obviously uh, that come from my family and come back, you know, to, to our immigrant story arriving into Canada. And it was, all, and these, you know, I don't think as a Chinese immigrant, the f there's, there's countless stories all, all about, you know, uh, the, the Civil War in China and, and all that baggage. And you hear it in the film, you hear me talking about my grandfather and his nostalgia. Um, and I think my mother's here. And, before I get too emotional, we did lose our grandfather this past, uh, that last year, uh, my, my mother's father. So I, it's kind of weird, and it's sort of an homage to hear his voice singing in this film that I haven't heard in so long. Um, but um, uh, there's certainly that, there was that going into it, that idea that, oh, China's so backwards, you know, like poor people of China. Of course, there's these ideas, but, uh, um, and that I think, uh, was quickly dashed um, w when I spent time, started to meet people, and and it was sort of an investigation for myself to learn about my 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 culture, my background, um, and hence the structure of the film with all these kind of offshoot moments. There are plenty more I can tell you, and uh, this was sort of what we siphoned it down to, but um, but it it greatly informed me, and it, and I think what my take home is is that. Uh, uh, it isn't black and white, you know, obviously. And uh, um, uh, um, when you start digging and you start looking at the, the human voices and the faces behind uh, uh, these sort of statistics and, and ideas of, of what a, what a cult, culture or country is without really knowing it, um, you know, once you peel that back and start getting to know people, then it can becomes a lot more complicated. And, uh, um, and so that's where I sit with it. You know, I, I see the necessity for uh, modernization, of course, in mainland China. And uh, I see the benefits. And I see the complications that come with it. And I hope it comes through in the film, those kind of, those kind of, um, those nuances. Uh, yeah. Those last two, the, the, particularly the end, some of those shots are really heartbreaking. Like the, yeah. you, know, you see the hut that's sort of, you know, that's not there anymore, and, and yeah. that, that time lapse, which is beautifully done, yeah, by the way, yeah. and that and that uh, uh, incredible scene where he's carrying the cabinet up the yeah. up the hill, which is just wow. That I think if I if I were if I, now if I were to do that, I would have put my camera down, and helped him maybe, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 slight guilt around that, but um, but yeah, that uh, uh, yeah, it's it was, you know. It's, it was powerful to be there, and it was, um, and I felt grateful for that opportunity to, to spend time with everyone. Yeah. Next, uh, as I'm trying to get somebody at the back. Yeah, the waiver at the back, and then we'll move down. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little shock there. <laughs> um, did you have any problems when you were shooting in China? Did the did the government know you were there? Did you have any yeah. issues for them trying to? I don't I think, know, censor you or whatever? Yeah, I think, well, I think enough time has passed. I can talk about this. <laughs> um, uh, well, at the time, we had to be very careful. The Three Gorges Dam uh, was not, you weren't allowed to really criticize it at the time. So that was sensitive. Um, um, so uh, <laughs> my mother's here. <laughs> uh, generally, it was, it was a, a very smooth shoot. Um, there were some run-ins that we had to be careful with, and uh, we were followed a little bit by some of the local Fengdu uh, police and such. And but we were fine. I worked with the local crew. The cinematographer was Chinese. Um, my whole crew was Chinese. In fact, uh, Fan Li Xing, the director of Last Train Home, was my sound recordist uh, at the time. So, so you know, we were a tight unit, and um, and we were careful, and and we felt driven to tell a story like this. Uh, Self-criticism on my part is just at the time I had this book with me. It was, um, and I recommend it. It was Herzog on Herzog, <laughs> and you know, at that age, um, uh, just having that that Werner Herzog, this great filmmaker, you know, and uh, and having his words in my ear as I was making this film did kind of guide me in in ways that I I think if I were to make the film again. I may not necessarily go in those directions, but uh, but I was feeling my way through it, you know, as a as a as a new filmmaker. So, um, you but weren't, you weren't really drawing attention to yourself either, because you had a small crew, right? And a small exactly, we were very under the radar. We were tethered to the um, through the cruise company, 
which is interesting in this version it was all blotched out but generally I think in the theatrical release we didn't do that it, and it was Victoria Cruises which is um, a, a Taiwanese American company that kind of let me in uh, very funny owner of the company um, just felt very helpful he was just helping me all the way through it it was weird and uh, <laughs> and then later the lawyers saw the film and they had to blotch out certain things that was for the uh, for this thing I think but uh, but generally the theatrical release was not and and I know now that they sell the movie on their cruise line so, um, so. Uh, yeah but there was someone in the middle there yeah go ahead with the guy yeah yeah, so I was just wondering, uh, what did a family end up doing yeah, good as question. a yeah. living? I was waiting for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, first question. And then secondly, I noticed, like, the music. It's mm. uh, just wondering, uh, how did how did you uh, select the, mm. the soundtrack? Because mm. I find it was very well intertwined with the scene, mm. showing, like, modern and ancient mm. Chinese. It, it yeah. is really good. Yeah. I have one one That's feeling funny. about the music. There's one track and what like one piece that uh, Olivier, my composer, did for me, and uh, and I realize now upon reflection that it's had a Japanese flavor, and I really didn't really want that to come across in the film. So I kind of cringe at it when I hear it sometimes. But um, but he was just going with his theme in the film, which you hear in the openings uh, of the of the film, which I think is quite powerful. Still, it that's quite a good soundtrack, uh, minus that little. Piece. But um, uh, I worked with a very good composer, and um, and I, I think it uh, music can do wonders in a film and really lift the emotional undertone of it. But I think you have to be subtle with how much you go with it. So that's um, so I think it. I think we found a balance in this in this film. Um, as for the Yu Shui and, and everyone in the movie, so. Uh, after we released the film in 2008 theatrically across North America, we, and some of you may have attended those screenings, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, we did raise some money for the family. We raised 75,000 US dollars, uh, put it in a trust, and uh, we, we helped the family uh, with education. Yushui left uh, the cruise ship and she got into a technical college with the funds that we had raised. And she is now currently working for a real estate company uh, doing accounting work. And she has a daughter. And she's married. So everything worked out well for her. Her fa uh, You mean Jerry? Quite about Jerry. <laughs> I lost. I kind of lost touch with Jim I, I think at the time after he made the movie, he decided to go into acting. And, I, and then I hadn't really I lost touch with him. But uh, of course, the Yu family was more important to me. and. Uh, um, and so everyone's done well. The, three, the, the other two kids have gone on to higher education. Um, the father, unfortunately, had a, uh, an aneurysm and, uh, and is now being taken care of by his, uh, his wife uh, full time. Uh, but I think the family has surrounded and kind of kicked in to help. But there are, I have photos that um, if anyone is interested in seeing them now with the daughter and everything on um, this Facebook link up the Yangtze, you can, you can find uh, recent photos. I'm in touch with them constantly. Yeah. We chat. Thanks for the question. There was someone down here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if we can get the mic right here. Thank you. Uh, it's funny that Jerry went into acting because I sensed this film was more of a fiction than documentary, <laughs> especially when I saw the tour guide. It's He looks so similar to that guy that Jia Zhang, Jia Zhang Ke used to cast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's I thought you hired him for yeah. a second <laughs> to, to act in the film. But yeah, I, I saw you did, uh, but in, at the time you filmed it, you took a very interventionist approach to your subject. I felt there. Um, your presence as a filmmaker is much more overbearing than the subjects. Mm. So we're very curious if you show the film to your subjects, uh, if you ever have shown the film mm. uh, to your subjects, what's their response? I have, I have shown it to them. Um, and I, I tend to do that for all, in all the films I make, I, uh, I make a point of showing it to them uh, before the release. Um, uh, yeah, it was emotional, the response with Yu Shui and the fan. I went to Chongqing and brought the DVD at the time and, and showed it, sat down with the family and watched the film. Um, and uh, it was moving for them, I think it was, um, I mean, it was something. Uh, obviously we didn't really know what 
the release would be like internationally and and then when it started to get, get more, some momentum, then we realized, okay, now we have an opportunity now to, to help the family. And that was always sort of the idea from the beginning, but uh, um, we obviously can't really, you don't really know what you can do until things come together. And we did take a journalistic approach uh, for the making of the film, which we didn't, we didn't pay the subjects anything, uh, but uh, we kind of reimbursed them through you know, donations and things like that with food and such. Upon reflection today, I think I would um, I would potentially consider some sort of honorarium or or payment, you know, for their time. But I think we did do that eventually for them. Um, yeah. Next, yeah, that's very nice. Um, can do one or two more. Anyone? Yeah, right there. Uh, if we can get the mic over here, we're, we're actually recording it. That's why we're. Particularly concerned about the mics. <laughs> Thanks. Um, when you were uh, setting out to make the film, I'm wondering how you first um, encountered Yushui and her family, and um, how you began making the film with with the family. It was a, a quite an extensive kind of research process. I um, I found the family. I found the characters through the cruise line. So they go through this recruitment process, uh, and I got in on that. And um, you know, uh, because of the friendly boss at the Victoria Cruises. And uh, they literally just go around uh, to all the local towns, cities that are uh, the, along the river, and they hire, they recruit. There's a high kind of fast, there's a, what do you call it, a high turnaround for the crew because um, people can't really, it's hard work. And, and kind of monotonous, too, on a cruise ship. I don't know if anyone's worked on a cruise ship, or uh, but it's sort of like... Um, it's like Groundhog Day. You literally kind of go through the same routine. Uh, the, there are new, you know, guests that arrive, and uh, but somehow you fall into this rhythm. That's like the same language, the same, same. You know, you see the same things up and down, up and down the river. So, people quit. Uh, so they hire a lot, and I got in on that sort of, I, sort of like a casting process. You know, in a way, a lot of. I think feature documentary, there is a lot of relationship to the fiction filmmaking process. You know, we, we use the same language in a way because we are telling stories and we have characters. And so, um, so yeah, we, we cast through the recruitment process. And one of my, you know, some of my, you know, con I wanted to find someone whose families were going to be affected by the, the, the flooding. And, um, and, and I wanted to have an array of different people from different backgrounds and so we we followed about five to six characters in the beginning of production and then as we went along we isolated oh yeah Yushe is you know she's got this arc you kind of gamble too in in terms of assessing like what's going to happen at the end so we we said Yushe and and then Chamboyu of course because he's so handsome and uh, could speak yeah. such lovely English so as a you know as this contrast there are a few others as we followed as well but uh, in the end um, you know, you have to make decisions, so we focused on three, and then in editing, you you whittle it down, you get your story. And you all, you always the personal reminiscence of your grandfather was always yeah. part of the uh, uh, the plan. Did it develop out of? Yeah, you know, we tried a few versions. We tried the one without, which is just the verite story, and I think it felt like at this time in the film, like just to kind of, it was nice to have my voice. Although I can't listen, it's hard for me to listen to my voice, but to have these sort of reflections of a country and, and, and to help place it for a, for a sort of international audience. Um, and it, I think it was sort of personal, you know. I, think I don't know if I would do it. I don't know if I, some of those I would put in there this time around if I were to make it again. But, uh, uh, but yeah, some of those kind of work. I don't, some of those are a little Herzogian that I don't really know if they... I'm sorry, I don't mean to criticize my own film, but I'm thinking about it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> think about it. But it, I think it grounds it in an interesting way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I think it's, that's it's, interesting. It's, it's a, it, it gives, it makes your perspective and your uh, relationship to the to the country and to yeah. the events, you know, clear. Right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I like that. I think that that kind of maybe that I, that structure carries through to my other films too. This uh, sort of that idea of. Uh, um, you know, being able to, to uh, certainly, I'm, and I'm saying this now because I'm working in the editing, I just came out of the editing room 
at the film board on my on this Robert Fisk documentary. Editing makes people very critical. <laughs> and think, it so. makes us like look at a, <laughs> look at the cut. Every cut counts. And that film is structured with a you know a present day Robert in the in you know in, uh, investigating researching you know in the Middle East, and then we we use him and throw back to the to to his past. So in the way, there's a similar idea of something like that, where where you can uh, use a sort of B thread to inform the A A thread. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that we can find that balance for this this new film. Cool. We can do. If you want to hear about that. One last question. Here to talk uh, about the Yangtze. Oh, oh. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. One last question, anyone? Yeah, at the back there. Actually, this is not a question, but a comment. And actually, it's more directed for your mom, wherever she is here. Uh, you want to ask her? Um, <laughs> where is she? <laughs> Oh, right there. I actually just wanted to tell you, like, um, it's it's amazing. Like the filmmaker is here, but as a parent, um, the fact that your son is standing before um, us and um, people around the world are critiquing, appreciating it. But like, as as a mother, as as a as a person who's seen your son through, like, took there's so many countless stories that need to be told and so many filmmakers that have like um dreams to like um have like their stories like uh, put together but like this piece when my husband and I watched it um to me it really touched me on so many levels in the sense that um the story like a lot of films if it touches you because it's a strong story and and Oftentimes, it's the story of the everyday. Like um, we get a lot of like um, surreal stories, like fantastical stories, like um, Marvel stories. But it really is when we look at it. It's like can we put ourselves in like um, the shoes of like the, the the people on the screens that we see, and like to be drawn up by the story, but also by like the ensemble of the the cinematography, like the editing, the sound, and like the humanity. I, I just wanted to say thank you for raising this filmmaker <laughs> and also like continue making your films here. Thank you for telling my mother that. <laughs> you should always end with uh, mentioning the mom. That's great. Uh, so thank you guys thank so you much for coming on such a cool night. Uh, and uh, hope to see you again. We're doing